but still open to amendment through an enhanced, inclusive, and participatory process that culminates in our people exercising their sovereign power through ratification in a democratic process in the form of a referendum. The High Court and the majority of the Court of Appeal with tremendous respect failed to appreciate that the tier and amendment process is one of the options available in the menu of constitutional designs options for dealing with the practice of abusive amendments just like other designs options limit amendability. For example, eternity crosses and basic structure and doctrine. Therefore, where Kenyans have selected the tier and amendment procedure as their response to the culture of hyper-amendability, I find it difficult to justify this judicially created fourth pathway of amending the Constitution founded on the basic structure and doctrine. Unfortunately, there was no justification provided to demonstrate the lacuna in the Constitution and hence the need to go in hand the basic structure and doctrine to enhance the existing tools of interpretation. The 2010 uh, history of Kenya is replete with precedents of application of foreign laws and doctrines from Commonwealth and other jurisdictions, which, which was done due to absence of local statutes. Today, I dare say that courtesy of our constitution, we have sufficient arsenals that include our own canons of interpretation, which we must exhaust before borrowing from other jurisdictions. Further, I see a potential conflict within the constitutional system with a judicially created fourth pathway for amending the constitution. This is for the simple reason that in our constitutional dispensation that is people-centered, our nascent democracy that respects the doctrine of separation of powers by vesting legislative power in the legislature to create a fourth pathway within the scheme of amendments would bring into question the place of the participation of the people and the place of the legislature in that scheme. Taking into account where we are at in our constitutional democracy, Kenyans needed to be consulted on whether it is their wish to introduce the fourth pathway for amending the constitution. In other words, we judges should be vigilant lest we are accused of usurping the sovereign power vested in the people by introducing a constitutional amendment through judicial fiat. Put differently, the tier and amendment process provided in Chapter 16 of the Constitution is a design option for dealing with the problem of abusive amendments and obviates the need for judiciary created limits to amendments power like the basic structure and doctrine. This is in line with the view expressed by Professor Rusarin Dixon and David Randau. My take home from this scholarly perspective is that tier and design of constitutional amendment process is one of the design options used to curbing the problem of hyper amendments. Professor Rosanai rightly points out in his well balanced amicus brief that the applicability of the basic structure doctrine depends very much on the context. The most important contextual consideration is the balance between flexibility and rigidity of the amendment process. The more difficult the amendment process, the less there is need for a doctrine of limits to limits to amendment power. The jurisprudential underpinning of this view is that in a case where the amendment process is multi-stage, it involves multiple institutions, is time-consuming, engenders inclusivity and participation by the people in deliberations over the merits of the proposed amendments and as downstream veto by the people in the form of referendum, there is no need for judiciary created implied limitations to amendments power through importation of the basic structure and doctrine into a constitutional system before exhausting homegrown mechanisms. 
Moreover, I fully agree with the portion of the judgment by Sishare J, where she questioned the viability of relying on judges to interpret on case-by-case -case basis on whether a particular provision of the Constitution is amendable. <coughs> to put this into perspective with respect to our constitutional architecture, amendment of entrenched provisions of the Constitution relating to the matters listed in Article 255.1 through popular initiative route requires, first, there must be public participation throughout the amendment process by dint of Article 10, two of the Constitution. Second, correction of one million signatures from registered voters in support of the initiatives as provided in Article 257. Third, support of the initiative through approval of the bill by a majority of the county assemblies as stipulated in Article 257. Seven. Fourth, consideration of the bill by the bicameral House of Parliament, Article 257.10. Fifth, subjection of the bill to a referendum in terms of Article 255, in which at least 25% of the registered voters in each, of at least half of the counties vote in the referendum, and the amendment is supported by a simple majority of the citizens voting in the referendum. Six, it should also be appreciated that the processing of the bill in the county assemblies and the bicameral houses of parliament is also subject to a further public participation requirement in terms of Article 196 and 118 respectively. Seventh, Article 88.4G imposes an obligation on voter education on INDC. Amendment of the entrenched provisions under parliamentary initiative routes <coughs> Uh, by dint of Article 10, 2 of the Constitution requires public participation, um, which must inform the entire amendment process. Second, the amendment bill has to go through the bicameral house. Looking at the two pathways for amending the entrenched provisions, it is inescapable to conclude that amending the core of fundamental provisions of the Constitution is a multi staged multi-institutional, time-consuming process that ensures that a constitutional amendment process that touches on the core of the fundamental aspects of the Constitution is transparent, inclusive, engenders the participation of the people. In a democratic society where they designed their own governance, I therefore find that the T and amendment process under the Constitution meets the set criteria as to when judiciary created basic structure doctrine is inappropriate and undesirable. Therefore, the two courts below hand by finding a fourth judiciary created pathway for amending the Constitution, which is, is with respect tantamount to amending the Constitution through the judgment of the court. To address the point of tiered amendments uh, post-2010 Constitution, uh, the amendment practice post-2010 Kenya Court illustrates that the tiered amendment design is an adequate work against abusive amendments. As pointed out by Sishare J in a dissenting opinion at the Court of Appeal, there have been 21 failed attempts to amend the 2010 Constitution during the first decade of its operation. 19 of these were through the parliamentary initiative and two were through the popular route. It is also notable that although the amendment bill had gone the farthest in amendment process, it was yet to be subjected to the ultimate down stream veto of the referendum process. Comparatively, the independence constitution and undergone 12 major amendments by its 10th birthday. In essence, it is right to conclude that the resilience of the 2010 constitution 
in its first decade, this proved that Kenyans attained the goal on balancing flexibility with rigidity in designing the amendment power as reflected in Chapter 16 of the Constitution. It ought also to be appreciated that judicial protection of implied limitation to the amendment power, such as through the basic structure and doctrine, become increasingly required in context where the country has too flexible constitution that can be amended fairly easily. Therefore, while it was inappropriate in the pre-2010 dispensation for the High Court, Lingera J. as he then was in the Joya case, to recognize the basic structure doctrine under the repealed constitution, there is no such need under the 2010 constitution. This view is founded on the premise that the risk of abusive amendments has been tamed by the tiered amendment process that entrenches the core of essential provisions through a heightened, elaborate amendment process. Considering the progressive nature of the Constitution, a three-judge bench, um, Koryu, Goge, and Odunga in Prisira Dururu case, expressed skepticism as to the continued reverence relevance of owning the Joya case on the basic structure post-2010 Constitution in light of the provisions of Article 255 of the Constitution. In contrast, the unique context of India with a too flexible constitution that grants the legislature the wide discretion in amending the constitution arguably justifies the judge-made basic structure as developed and practiced in India in order to stabilize the constitutional order and prevent the practice of abusive constitutional amendment given the rule threshold for amendment in the text of the Constitution, just as it was in our case prior to the 2010 Constitution. Although I think I've said enough to demonstrate why I, agree, I disagree with the judgments of the majority of the Court of Appeal bench regarding the application of the basic structure post-2010 Constitutional order, I will briefly highlight some of the critical aspects which were not considered by the two superior courts, and if the judges had done so, perhaps they would have come to a different opinion. Number one, the superior courts failed to appreciate that the concern with the culture of IPA amendment had already been taken into account during the drafting of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. This led to the design of the tier and amendment process that balances flexibility and rigidity. In such a context, the correct judicial posture ought to have been fidelity to our Constitution. This is informed by the reality that the Constitution, to a large extent, is self-contained and self-regulating in dealing with the legacy of abusive amendments in the former constitutional amendments. Therefore, there is no justification for courts to go outside the four corners of the Constitution to create a fourth pathway for the amendment of the Constitution. Number two, the Court of Appeal failed to analyze the provisions of Chapter 16 and to arrive to its own independent conclusion on the shortcomings of the three-tiered process and to state clearly whether it was necessary to coordinate a foreign doctrine, also to take into account the amendment practice in the post-2010 dispensation in the analysis of the Kenya's constitutional history, which shows that Chapter 16 of the Constitution has brought stability in the constitutional system in contrast to the culture of IPA amendment under the former Constitution. There have been multiple attempts to amend the Constitution, which were all unsuccessful meaning that the amendment process is not flexible, as in the Indian case. Three, the Court of Appeal failed to take into account the fact that Chapter 16 is one of the entrenched parts of the Constitution under Article 255.1 of the Constitution. Therefore, it could not be amended by the Court through created fourth pathway of amending the Constitution without following the constitutionally ordained amendment process 
uh, provided for under Article 255.1 of the Constitution. And fourth, the Court of Appeal failed to appreciate that Kenyans were aware of the idea around the basic structure doctrine during the constitution making phase in light of the legacy of the case of Joya, and yet did not embrace the idea of a veto to the amendment power as represented in the basic structure doctrine, as well as related to doctrines like internity crosses. The CKERC report on page 76 indicates that Kenyans yearned for power to have a say in amending the core fundamental features of the constitution through a referendum and an inclusive and participatory process. This was done through the provisions of Article 255 of the Constitution. Another aspect of the majority judgment of the court that I need to address relates to how the two courts treated the historical background informing the drafting of Chapter 16. It is evident that the decision on the question of the application of the basic structure and doctrine within Kenya's constitutional system was largely turned on historical inquiry to clarify and provide interpretative guideline on the intent of the Kenyan people during the drafting of the chapter 16. While this court has in the past celebrated the virtues and utility of the historical context, the background to the adoption of the constitution in the constitution interpretation is imperative. Given the subjective nature of the historical narratives, courts should endeavor to extract and have a view of the complete account of the historical background to the constitutional provision being interpreted, where a court embraces an account of history that marginalizes, excludes, or suppresses, or omits some portions of history accounts, such an incomplete uh, history distorts or rather fails to illuminate the meaning of the constitutional provision being interpreted, hence misleading the court to reach an erroneous conclusion. Before leaving this part, I will also address the argument advanced by Dr. Kaminoa that the basic structure and doctrine is applicable in Kenya pursuant to the provisions of Article 25 of the Constitution. The provision reads, and I quote, the general rules of international law shall form part of the law of Kenya. This court has already provided juridical interpretation of Article 25 in the case of Mitubel, where it was held, and I quote, in light of the foregoing, we hold that the once general rules of international law in Article 25 of the Constitution refer to customary international norms including Jews cogents. There is a general acceptance that customary international law requires in the words of Article 38 1B of the Statute of International Court of Justice, a general practice accepted as law. That is both sufficiently widespread and consistent practice and what states have accepted as law, opinio juris. Accompanying it, examples of customary international law include the doctrine of non referral of refugees and granting of immunity for visiting ends of states. Since the basic structure doctrine is a constitutional law principle acceptable in just a number of states and not an international law principle, it does not amount to a customary international law principle. Therefore, Article 25 of the Constitution cannot be the basis for founding the applicability of the basic uh, structure doctrine. In the end, I find that the basic structure doctrine and the four sequential steps for amendment as prescribed by the High Court and the majority of the Court of Appeal are not applicable in Kenya under the Constitution. Any amendment to the Constitution must be carried out in strict conformity with the normative standards and provisions of Chapter 16 of the Constitution. I will now move to the second issue, whether the President can initiate amendments to the Constitution through a popular initiative. 
The question raised was whether the president could initiate the amendment and uh, popular initiative routes provided for under Article 257 of the Constitution. Like other non-producing process, a constitution amendment process starts with an initial decision. That is the initiation or activation of the process. The initiative speaks to how the amendment process starts. The story starts with the 8th August 2017 presidential elections in which the president was declared by INDC as having been duly re-elected for a second term in office. The election results were challenged before the Supreme Court by Right Honorable Raira Ondinga, who had been declared as the runner-up to the presidential elections. The Supreme Court announced the results through a majority decision delivered on 1st September 2017 and ordered fresh presidential election to be conducted within 60 days of the nullification. However, the Right Honorable Raira Odinga and his political coalition the National Super Alliance withdrew from participating in the fresh presidential election, which took place on the 26th October 2017. Subsequently, uh, Right Honorable Laila Ondinga and the NASA coalition vowed not to recognize the government that was formed as a result of the fresh presidential election. This led to some incidents of violence that brought about tension in the country. After months of tension, the President and the Right Honorable Raila Hondinga in an act of statesmanship, patriotism and bipartisan, bipartisan accord emerged on 9th March 2018 to announce to the public that there was cessation of hostilities between the two political sides in what they called a handshake through a joint communique, building bridges to a new Kenya. It is in the quest to implement this noble objective of promoting national unity and overcoming other challenges and identified in the joint community that the president appointed the Building Bridges uh, Task Force. On 26th November 2019, the BBI Task Force released their report, which was unveiled to the public. On 10th January 2020, the president appointed the BBI steering committee uh, with the terms of reference that were stated uh, therein. As far as the president's actions with respect to setting up the BBI task force and BBI steering committee to further the agenda of promoting national unity were concerned, in my view, these actions cannot be faulted. He did the roundable acts of statesmanship executed with the, with, within the ambit of the provisions of Article 1.1.2c of the Constitution. This article demands nothing less from the President as it directs the holder of that venerable office to promote and enhance the unity of the nation. However, it is important to clarify that the legal constitutional question before this court does not go to the propriety of the pursuit of the building bridges to unity project. The question before the court is a narrow one, and it relates to whether a constitutional amendment process initiated by the president can be pursued through a popular initiative route prescribed in Article 257 of the Constitution. To answer the question as to who may initiate an amendment uh, process through a popular initiative requires that we understand the purpose that is intended to be served by introduction of the popular initiative as a route for amending the Constitution. The, this is pursuant to the purposive interpretation decreed by Article 259 of the Constitution. The constitution making history that I have highlighted demonstrates that a popular initiative was a tool carved out exclusively as a route for constitutional amendment by citizens. In essence, amending the constitution through a popular initiative was intended to be a citizen-driven and a citizen-centered process. 
The citizen-centric nature of a popular initiative is linked to the fact that it is conceived as a means for direct sovereign power to be expressed as contradistinguished with the parliamentary initiative which lies to the realm of the derived or delegated sovereign power. Under this understanding, the popular initiative is supposed to be triggered from below at the initiative of the citizenry as opposed to representative institutions. In other words, the popular initiative is intended to give citizens acting outside the institutions of the state a means to activate or trigger the exercise of their sovereign power. This understanding of the centrality of the citizens in activating a constitutional amendment process through a popular initiative is projected in the book that was referred to us by Joe Coron Lois, titled Constitutional Power and the Law. My analysis of Article 257, the history of constitution making process, and the, the authority cited in the said book, although persuasive, indicates that a popular initiative is an exercise of direct sovereign power that excludes the representative institutions, that is, the legislature and the presidency, which only exercises power that is derived or delegated sovereign power as distinguished in Article 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution. In other words, it is a means of direct democracy, and indeed direct democracy can only be exercised by the people, not their representatives, since that would convolute the form of democracy at play. It follows, therefore, that a popular initiative in a constitutional amendment process ought to be seen as an avenue through which citizens engage in the exercise of their sovereignty. As such, state organs being non bearers of direct sovereignty have no right to activate the popular initiative. This leads to the conclusion that the popular initiative is a preserve of the citizens, the one popularly known in Kenya as the Wanjiko. It is hard to be appreciated that the Constitution provides normative markers for how, when, where, and by whom particular powers are to be exercised. Article 257 delineates who has the power to undertake what duty or obligation as a right to undertake specific measures which respect, with respect to the constitutional amendment process. It is in appreciation of this that I need to interrogate the argument that the institution of the presidency has the authority to, in, to initiate a popular initiative in light of the overarching right motive of the constitution which is concerned with tampering or limiting the powers of the presidency. In its architecture and design, the constitution strives to provide explicit power to the institution of the presidency, and at the same time limit the exercise of that power. This approach of explicit and limited power can be understood in light of the legacy of domination of the constitutional system by imperial presidents in pre-2010 dispensation. As a result, chapter nine of the constitution lays out in great detail the powers and the authority of the president and how such power is to be exercised. Another reason that supports the finding that the president was not envisaged as an initiator of a popular initiative is the role of the president with respect to entrenched matters listed in Article 255, one of the Constitution, Article 256.5, as read with Article 257.10 of the Constitution, which grants the President a law that can be typified as serving as the guardian of the amendment process. In that, where a constitutional amendment bill is presented for accent, the President has the obligation of reviewing the bill and referring the bill to undergo a referendum process where it involves matters listed in Article 255 of the Constitution. Such a guardianship law over the amendment process ought not to be undertaken by the prayer in the amendment process, 
I therefore endorse the finding by the two superior courts that the president ought not to be both a prayer and an umpire in the amendment process. The last reason for finding that state institutions and presidents are ex excluded from using the popular initiative is to be found in Article 255, 3B of the Constitution. Uh, it shows that the Constitution recognizes a distinction between the people, the state bodies like parliament. It therefore follows that a state body like the institution of the presidency cannot fall within the rubric of the people as the very text of the Constitution makes this uh, distinction. This leads me to the inescapable conclusion that state institutions and state organs such as the presidency cannot initiate constitutional amendments via the popular initiative route provided for under Article 257 of the Constitution. Nonetheless, this finding does not dispose the issue as counsel for the president and even the attorney general sustained an argument that barring the president from initiating or pursuing constitutional amendment process through a popular initiative was a violation of the president's political rights as protected for in Article 38 one of the Constitution. Given that a process to amend the Constitution is a democratic process which is meant to give effect to self-government, the limitation and promotion of an initiative to change the Constitution is a political choice protected under Article 38 one c of the Constitution. However, there is an additional handle in deciding whether a right is applicable in a given factual situation. This is the concern with the right, rights range of application as provided in Article 22 of the Constitution, which provides every person shall enjoy the rights and fundamental freedoms in the Bill of Rights to the greatest extent consistent with the nature and the right of the fundamental freedom. What I deduce from this provision is that a court is under an obligation to interrogate whether a person arranging a violation of a right is actually a beneficiary of that right in, a, in question. In this context, it is notable that Article 38 one grants the freedom to make the political choices to every citizen. The citizen qualifier speaks to the range of application of the freedom to make political choices by limiting the rights enjoyments to the citizens. Therefore, for one to be a beneficiary of the freedom to make a political choice, they must fall within the category of the citizen. Based on the citizenship qualification, the freedom to make political choices is a right that does not accrue to state organs or institutions. State organs or institutions cannot be citizens because under Chapter 3 of the Constitution, citizenship is limited to living human beings excluding state organs. Consequently, while the president, when acting in his private capacity as a citizen, can enjoy freedom to make freedom political so choices, this right does not accrue to the institution of the presidency, which is a state organ. The presidency and other state organs do not fall under the rubric of citizens. I therefore find that exclusion of the institution of presidency and other state institutions from initiation of a process to amend the constitution the through the popular initiative route does not violate the political rights protected under Article 381 of the constitution. The last aspect of this issue relates to whether it was established through evidence that the process to amend the constitution through amendment bill was initiated by the president. At the outset, it should be pointed out that the concurrent findings by the two courts below was that the president, by a number of antecedent acts, and initiated the process, and the state was the real force behind the amendment process, including through the use of state resources to support the process. In a challenge to this finding, it was argued by the Attorney General and the BBI National Secretariat, that it is the BBI National Secretariat through Honorable Dennis Wawero and Honorable Junette Mohammed, 
who are the initiators and promoters of the impugned constitutional amendment initiative and or the president. An examination of the evidence before the courts reveal a number of things relevant to this factual determination. For starters, the president and the national executive took certain actions which portray his law in the initiation and promotion of the constitutional amendment. The president did not do those things as a private citizen, and this is clearly demonstrated in a number of ways. One, the president signed off the communique in March 2018. The official title of the president, the communique was published in a paper bearing the coat of arms of the republic and the seal of the president. The president appointed the BBI task force and the BBI steering committee task force during as it notice of 51-54 and 264 of 2018, respectively. The president received the official reports through a state function as president. As a result, it cannot be disputed that the president was involved in the initiation of the amendment bill. However, in my considered view, the president cannot be blamed for this because it is the promoters who took over the amendment bill under the auspices of the BBI National Secretariat, who had, by invoking the popular initiative route under Article 257, to pursue the amendment process. It is my finding that the genesis of the amendment bill can be traced to all these actions. I therefore affirm the factual findings by the two superior courts that the president was, uh, was involved in the amendment bill and agree with the finding by Toyot J. I believe I've stated enough to support by conclusion that the president of the state institutions are not permitted to initiate or promote a constitutional amendment process through the popular initiative route envisaged in Article 257 of the Constitution. This now takes me to the third issue, whether the second schedule to the amendment bill was constitutional. To put this question in context, it ought to be appreciated that the second schedule was intended to serve as a transitional scheme of implementing Clause 10 of the amendment bill. Clause 10, which intended to amend Article 89 of the Constitution, provided, and I quote, Article 89.1 of the Constitution is amended by deleting the ones 290 and substitute, therefore, with the ones 360. Clause 1.2 of the second schedule proceeded to distribute the additional uh, 70 constituencies uh, as per the schedule. It is in the above context that the constitutionality of the second schedule directly allocating and apportioning the proposed constituencies to specified counties were challenged. The two superior courts were unanimous in their findings that the second schedule to the amendment bill was unconstitutional. This finding was based on the substantive grounds that the second schedule violated the basic structure of the constitution by purporting to take away the mandate of the IMBC, an independent uh, body under the Constitution. Further, it was contended that the second schedule impermissibly directed IMBC on the execution of its uh, constitutional functions. It is imperative to begin the analysis on the constitutionality of the second schedule of the amendment bill by pointing out that given my earlier finding that the basic structure and doctrine does not apply under the Constitution of Kenya 2010, my determination of this question rests on the procedural concerns linked to whether there was public participation in coming up with the second schedule. This is because the provisions of Article 89 are amendable as long as due process is followed. 
it is hard to be appreciated that amendments touching on matters falling within the remit of Article 255.1, which are the core fundamental commitments of the Constitution, ought to be undertaken through a highly participatory and inclusive uh, process. It should be noted that directly allocating and apportioning constituencies usurps the mandate of IMBC, an independent constitution commission, removing the possibility of judicial review of the delimitation as an effect on the independence of the judiciary. The centrality of the constituencies as units of political representation in the National Assembly means that they ought to be apportioned and allocated by a neutral and professional actor, much more so because malapportioned constituencies have the potential of diluting the power of the vote and threatening the animating goal of fair and effective representation, which is at the heart of the foundational value of democratic governance enshrined in Article 4.2 and 10.2a of the Constitution. Further, since the constituencies are units of social and economic development through allocation of national government constituency development fund and the recruitment into disciplined forces such as the Kenyan Defense Forces and the National Police Service, the limitation of constituencies has implications on the constitutional values and principles of equity and social justice enshrined in Article 10 to B of the Constitution. It goes therefore without saying that the delimitation of constituencies must be accompanied by a process that is fair and just, which is the golden thread that runs through our constitutional order as elaborated in the preceding uh, chapters. I've also 